Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. You are the largest crowd at the DEC since the pandemic. Let's go. <laughs> Welcome back to the club. It's been an amazing summer. You all look tan and beautiful as you usually do. So I'm glad you're with us. I especially do want to welcome our DEC members. And if you're not a DEC member yet, just give me 10 seconds to convince you. Your next job, prospect, client, and even best friend might be right in this room. If you're not a member yet, we encourage you to join. You can do so at econclub.org. And if you're not a member and you want to do so today, we'll give you a free event ticket that you can use between now and the end of 2023. See Megan at registration on the way out to lunch. Quick reminder, as we get started, please silence your cell phone so we do not disturb the program. And many of you have been with us before. You know we always begin with a pledge of allegiance and a prayer. So I'd invite you to please stand and join me. The flag is down by that screen to my right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Brother Gary Wegner, Executive Director at the Capuchin Soup Kitchen. Thank you. God of the universe, in this season of creation on the cusp of autumn, we make our own the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, who sang out in his Canticle of the Creatures, praise to you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness to you, most holy one. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. In heaven you form them clear and precious and beautiful. We are grateful for the gifts we have been given, even as we are mindful to remember and pray for the hungry, the homeless, and the forgotten. As we gather in this great city of Detroit, on this day that you have given us, we thank you for the beauty of the earth and those we love. As we echo the words of that same hymn, for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild, to, vote we to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. God of the harvest time, bless our strolling lunch. Bless the workers in the kitchen. Bless the servers at their stations. Bless our speaker. Bless us all today, tomorrow, and for all eternity, amen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Gary, and you may all be seated, please. A couple of welcomes and shout outs before we bring our guest out. I want to say hello to our amazing mayor, Mike Duggan, right down here. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Former mayor, Dennis Archer. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Right down in the front, the DEC's outstanding board chair, Sandy Pierce. Thank you, Sandy. I think Peter is out here. There he is. J.P. Morgan, Vice Chair Peter Shear, who leads their $200 million investment in Detroit. Thank you, Peter. Somewhere from Grand Rapids, the CEO of the Economic Club of Grand Rapids joined us with two guests. And her name is Natalia Kovacek. Where are you, Natalia? There she is. Thank you, Natalia. Now, you thought you won the furthest, furthest travel award today, but I've got to burst your bubble because we've got somebody that came in just for this all the way from Denver, Colorado. So nice try, Natalia, maybe next time. But you're welcome here. Thanks for making the effort. And a special thank you to DEC board member and J.P. Morgan Vice Chair Jason Tinsley, who you'll see in a moment, for his support of today's meeting. We also love, as you know, having high school and college students with us each meeting. They're up there in the balcony. They're here courtesy of our generous corporate sponsors. Their day already began with a really cool private 
reception with Jamie Dimon. So I want to take a moment and tell you who is with us today. We've got a group of students from Catholic Central High School, thanks to Andy Storm and Invio Automation. And we've got two groups from Wayne State University, thanks to Jason Tinsley and Mike Hansen from BDO. And then, of course, two groups from the best darn high school in the land, the Alex and Marie Manugian School, compliments of Terry and Jenna and the General Motors Company and Adam Robbins Accenture. Let us greet the students and thank our sponsors with a nice round of applause. I also want to welcome former DEC CEO, Beth Chappell. Hello to Beth. All right, really quick, upcoming programs with today's meeting. We're launching into our new season, October, November. We've got something for everybody, and that includes our very popular Future of Work series. Early November, we'll look at the physical workplace and bringing people back to the office. Yes, we need to get back to the office, people. I'm tired of looking outside my window. I need to see more people out there. So get them back to the office. In mid-November, we'll host Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago CEO Austin Goolsby for an economic update. And I'm told he is a blast to listen to. So tons more on our website. Get those tickets before they sell out. I also want to take a quick moment to recognize our sponsors and partners. They are the reasons we can bring you terrific program like today, so thank you if you're part of those organizations. And finally, use your smartphone and you can be involved in today's program. One, take lots of pictures and share with your social media network using hashtag econclub. Two, you can submit a question for Jamie using the QR code that you see on the screen. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer who's about to go to work. Jason Tinsley is vice chairman of J.P. Morgan Private Bank. He is a DEC board member, a really good friend to the DEC, a better friend to me personally, and a big time supporter of so many things in our city, region, and state. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jason Tinsley. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, DEC members and guests. I have the honor of introducing our guest today. Jamie Dimon is in his 23rd year as chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, a global financial service firm with assets of 3.2 trillion, 300,000 employees, and operations worldwide. Now, by any account, Jamie is the most sought after voice for the global economy in Wall Street, but he also understands the impact on Main Street is truly what matters. So we are delighted that Jamie chose to spend time with us today, actually this week. Jamie earned his bachelor's degree from Tufts University and holds an MBA from Harvard Business School. Now today's moderator is Dennis Archer Jr., the founder and CEO of 1642 Ventures. 1642 was the parent company to a number of operating companies and strategic investments, including Ignition Media Group, Archer Corporate Services, and my favorite, Central, Car Central Kitchen and Bar. <laughs> Archer received both his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Jamie Dimon and Dennis Archer to the stage. Thank you, Jason. Now, before we begin, this week marks the 10th anniversary of J.P. Morgan Chase's $200 million investment in the city of Detroit's comeback, an investment that was never about charity, but always about making sure Detroiters had access to capital, jobs, and affordable housing. So before I throw this to Jamie and Dennis, please turn your attention to the video screen for a short video on the impact of our investment. Thank you. This Motor City has seen a long road. Together, we've traversed the uncertain unknown. There's a greater story waiting to be told, a community of gold. We make it happen. For me, Detroit is home. It is where I was born and raised. It is a place where the people hustle hard. We're super resilient. We've gone through a whole lot and have always found a way to bounce back. 
I got lucky that I came to the city at the same time J.P. Morgan Chase was invested in Detroit. That allowed me to get access to capital to rehab these houses. The house is gonna go to an actual family. We might have put them on a different trajectory. J.P. Morgan Chase has been with the Detroit at Work system almost since our inception, helping to fund the work to transform jobs and training in the city. Detroiters are deserving of jobs that are professional, that provide a long-term pathway to other employment opportunities. Because I'm a born and raised Detroiter, I'm proud to serve the community that raised me. J.P. Morgan Chase was able to help me grow exponentially within my business. I get to bring my children out to job sites that I've worked on, and they get to see the revitalization of the city. Threads of creativity woven into the fabric. The world awaits our unique magic. Let's fill the gaps with grit and passion. By working together, we make it happen. Jamie, good afternoon. Dennis, how are you? Let me just first say, I've been around a lot of people, actors, movie stars. You got like this rock star thing going on. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen... Don't they have that commercial? You're not supposed to call boring business people rock stars? And... <laughs> but I've never seen people want to take selfies with bankers. Yeah. It's, 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 it's incredible. <laughs> um, let me just say this. First of all, welcome to Detroit. Um, almost welcome home. Uh, you've been coming here for a while. You know, in, in talking to Jason, um, he mentioned that you read four or five newspapers every morning before seven, and that you read uh, four or five books a month. So I brought you two of my favorite <laughs> books. One is probably somebody you already know, Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table. Yes. Uh, and the other is about the history of Detroit's Paradise Valley, an historic district in Detroit, historic African-American district. So I hope you'll add these yes, to your you. list. Thank you, thank you. Um, First of all, there's a question, you know, you mentioned before about being able to crowdsource policy and understanding what happens uh, around the world, particularly as it uh, relates to a regulatory framework. I will say that my question and path of our discussion today has been crowdsourced because as soon as people heard that I was talking to you, I got inundated with questions and suggestions. But there was one that stood out far among the rest, and it is, would you consider a run for president of the United States? <laughs> So first of all, I am thrilled to be here again. I've been coming here since Mayor Coleman, Dennis Archer, your dad, who I met today again, and uh, watched the city struggle, go up, go down. And, but recently, with this new mayor, not new anymore, Mayor Duggan, just it's extraordinary to see the revitalization of one of America's great cities. And uh, I do not intend to run for president, but I tell people I would love to be president, but you're going to have to anoint me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to run. I think we torture our politicians. Uh, I do think that the country needs a lot of help and a lot of support, and, and that you know Detroit's a perfect example of collaboration works and yelling and screaming at each other doesn't. Collaboration is block by block, house by house, company by company, not for profits, universities, schools. But without good government, it wouldn't be possible because we we see this around the world. You've got bad local government; it's impossible to fix anything. Understood. Yeah. Um, regrettably. Uh, so we got 27 minutes left, and this is the path we're going to take. We're going to talk about Detroit. We're going to touch on leadership, diversity, the national, federal, particularly regulatory framework with the Fed decision coming down at 2.30 today. And we're going to end with talking about the geopolitical landscape. You talk about an unwavering commitment to helping clients, communities, and nations. And you are here celebrating both 90 years in Detroit and then 10 years uh, since the announcement of your investment here. Why was it important for you personally to be here? Yeah, so you, some of you know, but if you look at you, the Economic Club started in 1934. Now General Motors started the National Bank of Detroit in 1934. National Bank of Detroit merged with Bank One for Chicago. We all have all these problems, which is why I ended up there. Uh, but I, all, I always knew that a financial institution, you know, when you lose one, it's kind of like a big hole in the ground. And a lot of these institutions, not just ours, but all big institutions, they've always played a local role. In local schools and local hospitals and local charities and hiring and training, and that's what they do. And so, you know, we, and, we, and you made another good point, we want to be here through thick or thin. So we're always very proud that J.P. Morton Chase is the same thing year in. You don't have to worry about us. You don't have to worry that we won't be there. We're not going to flip-flop. We're going to support our clients. And we know when time is tough, you need us the most. And so when we saw uh, a, a new mayor who was talking the way he was, 
we, we basically said, we're going to double down in Detroit. We already have big market shares here. It wasn't like we were in a big Detroit hometown, but we saw a chance to help change it. And this mayor was saying, I forgot where I read it, but business, come on in. You know, Not-for-profits, come on in. Anyone who can help me do a good job for my citizens, which is the attitude you need. And then, of course, great leadership and management around that. So, you, know, you talk about making dreams possible. But I, but I made this point last night. People act like it's an either-or situation. If you lift up Detroit, that helps everybody in Detroit. It helps right. the kids, it helps the businesses, it helps the rich get richer, it helps the non-rich earn money. You know, and this notion that somehow that businesses shouldn't participate in that, they have forever. You know, even a small town, a lot of these small, you know, bakery shop gets, you know, participates in making the town better. They may help the local church, a local little league, give someone a summer job. That's called humanity. And if a town does that well, the whole town is better off. You know, and I, so I think it's a mistake that somebody make a binary. Businesses are here to make a profit, and you know, uh, government's here to support citizens. I agree. I think if you look at the success Detroit has had over the course of time with Mayor Duggan and previous mayors that have been successful, it has been for that reason because all of those stakeholders have come together, and Detroit is great in that way. You know, you talk about making dreams possible for everyone, everywhere, every day. You also stress that the financial support, and Jason mentioned this in his remarks, was an investment, not philanthropy. Yeah. Has that investment paid a return? Is it paying a return? Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, Nicola Hassan, who runs marketing, is here, uh, was talking about, we always had values, but we talked about how we do business, but we went back to, like, why we're here every day. And when we speak to our people, we, that's what we do. Every day, 60,000 middle market companies, 100 countries around the world, 80 million Americans, and we bank the World Bank, the IMF, the uh, development banks around the world. We bank cities, schools, states, and hospitals, which is why I'm kind of sick and tired of hearing from folks, particularly Democrats, that we're bad. I, I just can't stand it anymore. That's what we do. We lift up society. It's no, not always about profit. It's not always about shareholder value. It's about sometimes just being, you know, doing the right thing. And so the Detroit thing was $200 million. This was different. We came here, and we finally said with Peter Shearer in the room, who did all the heavy lifting, and uh, you know I always get credit for things I didn't do and blame for things which I did do sometimes. This one is all this one is all Peter and his team. But we came in and, as opposed to consumer doing consumer, or investment banking doing investment bank, and philanthropy doing philanthropy, and small business. That one coordinated effort, massive effort, can we make a change? And I would and a little piece that's philanthropy. But a lot of it is you know loans we get return and stuff like that. But our market shares in almost every business are up ten. 10%, 15%. So, you know, do we, do we get more respect here? Yeah. Do we make more commercial loans? I think it's 30%. More small business accounts, 50%. So it does lift up business, which we benefit from. And some of it, we, we are very specific. We put in X dollars, how many jobs are created? We put in X dollars, how many affordable homes? You know, if it costs a million dollars per affordable home, that's not an affordable home. That's, that's giving away money. And so we, we try to be very rigorous, but yes, it paid. The other very important thing about the lessons here, we, you, we, we learn so much here, we're doing it elsewhere. We call them mini Detroits, mm -hmm. you know, and including Paris. You know? And so you, when you look at it, how we got smarter, we share it, we disseminate it. You know, Peter and the mayor should go on the road and educate the rest of the world about some of the things that actually work and don't work. Uh, and again, it's not Democrat or Republican whether crime goes down or you know, the land businesses get there, the lights are turned on, the hospitals work better. And so, yeah, a lot of lessons in what we've learned here, and we try to share them openly. So understanding there's not a presidential bid in the future, um, though, how would you define yourself as a leader or your style of leadership? Hmm. You know, that, that's going to be written by other people, as you well know. And it might start with the son of a bitch. But um, <laughs> I, I think I was at a th thing like this, a town hall, and one of my direct reports, not my direct, someone asked the question, how do you show gratitude? After I was watching Teddy Lasso and telling him I love it, I love the gratitude. They said, how do you show gratitude to direct reports? And damn it, I couldn't answer the question because I kind of don't. You know? and, and, but I did realize, which I then said, two of them were in the room burst out laughing. But I did said, I really mean it. They know how much I care, that I'll break my back for them. I'm reachable 24 seven. The truth is the truth is the truth. I'm not trying to defend what I said. I'm not trying to make up. I just want to do the right thing for the company, clients, the country, and stuff like that. And they know how much I deeply respect and trust them. And uh, so that's part of it. I am friggin' relentless. I think if you're going to run a big institution, you damn well better be relentless. 
because they just get slow, bureaucratic, and stupid over time, in spite of the fact most of the people are good. So just, and that's true for small institutions. I'm sure you see it at 1642. Absolutely. It slows down, and you know, so you gotta get that. Uh, I'm highly curious, always learning, get on the road all the time, reach out, talk to people all the time. You know, we have, we have our bus trips, you know, tell people, we have tellers on the buses and branch managers, and when they get on, we give them beer and immunity. <laughs> that, tell us what, and I really mean it, and they know I mean it. I return almost all my phone calls and emails every day. My staff treats everybody with respect. So they, they know those things, but I couldn't characterize it. Uh, I, I, and I suck it up and get it done. Like every, like every one of you, I'm exhausted sometimes on a Friday, but by Monday, I suck it up and I start again. I'm, I'm not completely normal that way. And so. Uh, it's very interesting that you say it'll be written by others, because I actually called some people that work with you that I know. <laughs> And I said, do you want to tell me about him? And do you, you want to hear what they had to say? Yeah, go ahead. OK. Uh, <laughs> Alicia Bo Bowler Davis, while taking Dylan, flying him to, to school at Stanford, I talked to her. And she's the CEO of Alto Pharmacy and sits on Jamie's board. And these are her exact words. Authentic, opinionated. He's right a lot. Huge fan of Detroit. In <coughs> fact, brags about Detroit. Mem memory like an elephant. A people person, generally cares about people, <coughs> gen intentional about diversity, and what you see is what you get, uh, which is, I think, consistent <coughs> with what you said. And Melody Hobson, another board member, uh, said, smart, straight shooter. His team is loyal to him, and he's loyal to his team. Um, kind heart, cares about people, does the right thing, and does not live in gray zones. And what I thought was uh, most impactful was a tremendous capacity for simplifying complexity, which in your field and for the people with whom you speak, I think is very important. You know, I personally believe that um, leadership is a lot about timing, particularly <coughs> politically. I think that when Coleman Young was elected mayor, it was a time for his style of leadership. I think when dad, you were elected mayor, it was time for your style of leadership. We absolutely needed Mayor Duggan, what you brought to the table and have illustrated during your terms. With an upcoming presidential cycle, not asking you to pick a horse, and since you're not in the race, what characteristics should we look for for the next person who occupies that office? Well, look, I think they have to have a broad set. I never look for one thing because you know, one unbelievable flaw can end someone's ability to do a good job. So like a real work ethic, but I think, uh, I think they, in my own view, they have to educate the public more. Why we're doing what we're doing. Why we have to make tough decisions and not read the polls. And uh, you know, including about Ukraine, education, uh, all, the, all the, the things we gotta fix and so educate and also bring in very good people around them. I mean, there's no job you can do on your own and particularly being president. You need the best and the brightest around you and that kind of has stopped in the last several presidencies. Like just, you know, it's now like more like when you remember your old kids and you said, I'll be president, I'll make you my secretary of state, and you'll be my defense. It's it's kind of like that now. It's like who, <laughs> who are people comfortable with as opposed to the best and the brightest? Uh, and you know, and and explain it to people. Like, you know, I thought this Ukraine thing was so serious that I I was thinking to myself, I did a State of the Union address, it would have been uh, right after the Ukraine invasion. Today everything changed. If you had any notion the world is safe, it's gone. Therefore, you know, we're gonna do this with the military, this with their allies, this with the help in Ukraine, and this with so, uh, a bunch of other things. And, and uh, I would end by saying, and by the way, the federal workforce, back to the office tomorrow, 100%. The state, you know, you go to Washington, D.C., they're not there. And I, I don't know how you run a country like that, personally, so. So before we get into talking more about the federal government <clears throat> regulation, I wanna touch on diversity. Uh, it is something that you've made clear is very important to you. Um, we just heard from Jason Tinsley, who's been elevated to vice chairman. Congratulations, Jason. Um, Jason. You got Tara Offerman, who's running your commercial business. You've got two black women on your board and a number of other women on your board, very diverse. Why is that important to you, and why is it a business imperative? Yeah. You know, this go, if you go way back, I think it's a business imperative for three reasons, each independent of themselves. They don't have to weigh them balance them. One is the right thing to do. You know, uh, you have the black community has been left behind 
Uh, it's been 175 years since the Civil War, not even remotely close to parity. We should recognize that and do something about it. When we talk about policy, I want to talk about the lower income community a little bit. Second of all, it's, uh, I think it's a business imperative because if I'm picking the best team from everybody and you're picking the best team from middle-aged white men, I will have a better team. And I just don't understand why. And the third is community, you know, diverse, the actual diversity, which is if you go to Chinatown or India town or Greek town or, you know, a black town, et cetera, the, the people there know more about those communities, how to reach out to them, how they relate to people, you know, and so I think it does help do that because you're just reaching out to other communities. And we do that to all communities, not just one community. And so uh, uh, that's why. We made a, a big effort uh, years ago. We've been, you know, J.B. Moore Chase has been doing this my whole, you know, before I got there. But we also reckon, we talk about diversity one day and we lump it all together and how great we are. Because when you talk about Asian, LGBT, women, uh, black, Hispanic, oh, we were great. But if you talk about each one separately, we actually were good in all of them except black. We were better than most. Certainly better, by the way, than law firms, private equity, hedge funds. Uh, but we hadn't made enough progress, so we set up a separate effort. And this is always great matter. Just a separate effort. This job, that your only job is retention, recruiting, f fixing that problem. So for example, you know, we, I, we used to recruit at two or three HBCUs. I thought there were four. There are 106. We recruited, you know, 25 of them now. And for anyone, could, you want to hire some bright-eyed kids who want to work hard, go to code HBCUs. And so, you know, you learn how to get better at all these things. And, you know, we're up to like 50% black EDs and MDs since then. Murder George Floyd, we doubled down with the DEI effort about mortgages, affordable housing. <clears throat> and I think it's the right thing to do. And this affirmative action thing, in my view, isn't going to change anything in what we do. So forget the legal side of it, so it might change a word or something like that. There is nothing wrong with a company reaching out to different communities. You know, and we don't treat it either or. When we realized we had too few black advisors, we didn't go to the people hiring in white parts of the country and saying you have to get out some white people and hire black. We started a special effort, to, I think, to, to hire and train 100 black financial advisors. And those kind of things work, and they're not you know, a quota. And so we're going to continue doing that. I'm sure there'll be slight adjustments when the lawyers go through all the wording and stuff like that. But uh, like, it's just the right thing to do. The country's been doing this. You know, almost everyone's, my, my grandparents are Greek immigrants who didn't go to high school. The country's been reaching out, trying to lift up people forever. That is part of, of America. So, you know, I'd be remiss at 2.30 today, um, Chairman Powell will host um, a press conference and announce what's going on with uh, interest rates. They've raised uh, the last 11 out of 12 times over the past 21 months, <coughs> reducing their balance sheet. Um, do you think that this is the proper steps that need to be taken to get inflation back in line and, yeah. and affect the economy? Well, to give you a little bit of history and the complexity of the subject. Uh, You're going to simplify the complexity I am. for us. Okay. They, they were a day late, a dollar short. We were still spending like drunken sailors. Rates were at zero percent. Inflation already taken off. Unemployment, or, and obviously, I think they did the right thing early in COVID. They just continued doing it, throwing fire and fuel. They were late. This rapid increase was catching up. They're kind of caught up. I don't think it matters at all with another 25 basis points or 50 basis points or something like that. And no one knows, the Fed doesn't know, because you, if you look at the Fed dot plots, they've been 100% wrong. Not just 100% wrong, every one of them was 100% wrong. And, uh, and so I just, be, be cautious and be humbled about this, which by, I think Jay Powell, I think they are. I think they realize that they don't really know, so they're trying to navigate now. You know, they don't want to sink the economy. They're, my view, and this is a view, and I'm going to give it odds, I think the odds are higher that they will have to go higher than they are today. I'm not talking about this vote today. I'm talking about four months from now, six months from now, that inflation will be at 4% and won't be coming down for a whole bunch of different reasons, partially because the fiscal stimulus, we're spending even more like drunken sailors. And, you, you know, folks, you can't put in your models that somehow inflation is going to come down where the government is spending everything we're doing now Milita the whole world is remilitarized. The green economy is, is spending money. IRA is spending money. The CHIPS Act is spending money. Uh, you look at anything we're doing, it's more money. And so I think inflation isn't that quick. Rates go up. And I think the risk is that the longer rates go up too. So the whole curve goes up. And then we have quantitative tightening. We've never had quantitative tightening before. I don't know how people can say with certainty what the effect is reversing is going to be. They are going to have to sell $2 trillion to Treasury. So Treasury selling... Uh, two trillion dollars this year. The central bank's got to sell a trillion dollars this year, and a lot of buyers around the world are sellers. Years ago, they were all buyers. And I don't know the full effect of that, and so I'm a little 
we're going to have to wait and see. I'm a little more worried about than other people. You know, Jamie, you've also. But, but, meanwhile, but meanwhile, we have a very strong economy. But don't confuse today with tomorrow. This other stuff is kind of tomorrow, and if and when it affects the current economy, you know, we'll, we'll see. You've also um, said, I think, multiple times that despite that, it's not necessarily interest rates, inflation, a forthcoming recession or not that most concern you, but it's more the geopolitical risk, cyber attacks, large dysfunctional markets, uh, partially due to poorly calibrated yeah. regulations. Yeah. Speak to that. Yeah, so I think the minor part of what you said is the, I do believe that regulations are poorly calibrated. I don't want to bore you all with that. because I Look, they'll figure it out. I almost don't really care. I care about my country more. I, I guarantee you there'll be dislocated markets. It's almost guaranteed to happen. Don't be surprised when it happens. It's almost in the cards and the way certain these things have been set up. Again, I don't think that's the most significant thing, nor is inflation. You know, we've all had inflation and recession and stuff like that. I think the most significant thing, which is about the freedom of democracy for the next 100 years, and I think that battle will be fought in the next 10 years, uh, is Ukraine. This Ukraine war is affecting all global relationships. And so, you know, economically, it's got an immediate effect on oil, gas, food, migration, but it's affecting our relationship with the Middle East, our relationship with Africa, China, all trade relationships. The whole world is remilitarizing. So we are, this is the most important thing that we get this right. And the only thing that can fix that is American leadership. And I'm not saying that because I'm an ugly, uh, uh, arrogant American. There is no other nation with the military muscle, the economic muscle, the moral muscle that can lead. And we should lead politely. You know, we too much, we just literally are like that big dinosaur. We make a stupid decision. That tail just, you know, whips our allies. Like we did that with the IRA Act. We've done that with a bunch of other things, like with thoughtlessly. So we need diplomacy, development, finance. It's got to be comprehensive. But this, this is the most important thing. And if that goes wrong, uh, and then I put around that nuclear proliferation, even climate. You know, if you, without American leadership, you're not going to solve climate, you're not going to solve nuclear proliferation. So that is my biggest concern for, their, for but it's for the next generation. It's not whether the economy is okay in the next year or not. We're going to come back to Ukraine and we're going to talk about China as well. But coming back to domestic policy for a second, you mentioned uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, you mentioned the CHIPS Act. You've talked about the necessity yeah. to have manufacturing be in the United States. What should the federal government policy look like to uh, encourage that yeah. activity? Yeah, so first, I, it's not about manufacturing. It's about jobs, you know, it's about, so there are th things that we need for national security is a sine qua non. And so some of the things in IRA were about that. Some of the things in CHIPS were about security. Same about rare earths. And that we have to do, and we need industrial policy for that because they can't make money doing those things here. But industrial policy should be simple, not place-based, not union-based. It should be tax credits, like for just we want it here, we want, they'll do it the right way, let the, let the free market economy uh, take care of that. Then there are a bunch of other things related to that, which I say is, is competitive. Can we compete in solar, you know, if, if China dominates and you state enterprises to consolidate control and you know, sell the goods cheap here, we can't. So that either between trade policy and industrial policy, but what I, I am really afraid about, I'm not afraid about, you're gonna be, we're gonna be writing books about this, is the misuse of that money now. It, the, the amount of money that is going into the corporate trough where all these corporations are going there getting gifts and money and they get it from the federal government and they get, then they want it from the state government, now they're gonna want it from the city government, it's gonna get ugly and a lot of it's gonna be misspent, a lot of it's gonna be wasted, it's unfortunate. Industrial policy should have come with twins, permitting, and rules that make it inviolate that the government gets involved other than the economic side of it. Because once politics get involved in that, it's about gifts, which becomes corruption. Who gets who to give what to when and how, and so I kind of, I, so I still believe in it. I just, it, we didn't put the guardrails on it properly, and we're gonna pay for that. And by the way, on the, on the climate side, we're not gonna solve climate either. It's, it's, not, it's not enough. It's not the money, it's the policies we haven't done right, and, so we're gonna waste a lot of money before we realize CO2 is not going down. And what are we gonna do about that? And that's why we need permitting reform. And we can't build grids. We can't build uh, you know, pipelines to get coal into plants, to, to get gas into plants to use coal, which is the best way to reduce CO2 in the short run. And it's gotta be part of national treaties. America is you know, 20, 15% of world pollution. India and China and parts of South Asia are 70%. If they don't do it, it doesn't make any difference what you do here. I, so I just think we've, we're kind of missing the boat here on how to get this right. And we're celebrating the spending of the money, 
and that money is just going to drive inflation. That's all that's going to happen for now. So. You talk about China. You visited China, I think, in May. Um, you came back saying that we should be, I think, highly cautious. Um, and I think if I can summarize, you feel that we shouldn't be fearful, but we should actually have more engagement and communication yeah. with China. Yeah, I do. So here, you gotta, when you make an assessment of a problem or any issue, like you got to do a full assessment. You know, China has this. China is no 10-foot giant. Our GDP per person is $80,000. Theirs is 15. We have all the food, water, and energy we need in America and the northern and southern hemisphere. They don't. They import 11 million barrels a day, half of which go by American warships every day. They're, and their neighborhood, we have Mexico, which is a fabulous country you should be helping, and Canada, you know, and, and the Atlantic and the Pacific, they have Philippines, Japan, Korea's, Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan, India, Russia. It's a tough part of the world. Every one of those nations is rearming. And, if you, and they're having battle skirmish with India today. And if you think those nations are happy with China, China's pissed them all off. So it's not us. So, and then the, what our, our founding fathers gave us, free enterprise, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. That, you know what that's about? That's about you as human beings can do whatever you want. You can work where you want. You can start where you want. You can take your money you want. You own what you own. You can, you know, and we're, and we're losing this thing about free enterprise. What it means, it's not about capitalism. It's about human freedom. And that human freedom is the most innovative country the world has ever seen, is this country. If you were going to put all your money in one country in the world, it would be America. If you were going to open up our borders to everybody, three billion people would come here. America's got nothing to be embarrassed about. We've got to get our act together around China. And it's around this IRA. That, that complexity may be beyond our capability. We just don't function that way. But I think we can do that. And yes, we should negotiate with him. Some will be unilateral. We're not going to do this with you. You're not going to do this. Some of be negotiated terms. I think that when I, when I hear Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Gina Raimondo, they're now they're saying all the right stuff. We're going to do what we got to do for national security, unfair competition. We're going to work with our allies, and we'd like to negotiate with you. And that's what they should be doing. You know, from a, from a country's perspective, and then as business people, as many of us are here, how do we pair, prepare ourselves for these ge geopolitical extremes? That, that seem to be coming more and more often. Yeah, so one, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, you're never strong through weakness. I mean, we need to do with our military whatever we have to do to be safe for the next 50 years. And if that costs another $50, $100 billion a year, so be it. There's no chance that China or anyone else can keep up with us. And I think that that, that is paramount right there. And you gotta explain it to the American people. I don't wanna waste your money. But I also don't want you to wake up one day with you know, nuclear threats in our cities and, or terrorism and stuff like that. And, and then to and this support that with other policies which are around having great, a great economic system. Like the foundation of all of this, the foundation of helping our poor people, the foundation of Detroit, the foundation of America, the foundation of the military, is America's economic prosperity, which we've done a shitty job on now for 25 years. You know, and it grows, but it grows uh, uh, slowly because you know, we, we throw grains of sand in there, bureaucracy, litigation, regulation, you know, place-based things, schools that don't work. I mean, it's outrageous. And I just, I look at, you know, what we do and I say, okay, well, the reason we're going to 1.7% as opposed to 3% is because of what we do to ourselves. And, and because business is powerful, we do 1.7. So the idiots in Washington say, well, you're growing at 2%. Policies are working. I'm saying no. As a company, you always ask, what should you be doing? We should be growing at 3.5%. Most of your policies are making 1.5%. If Had we grown at 3% the last 20 years and not 1.7, that'd be $15,000 per person more income. Per person. And we could have paid for childcare and K-4 and better work skills and all that stuff without having to kill each other over it. So these, things, these policies are important. And I'll, I'll just also say there, and this, I might write an op-ed about this. We've done a terrible job for a lower 30% of our income society. Mm -hmm. And think of rural areas, inner cities, and think of basic stuff, income. So most Americans don't even know this, but I think that bottom 30% makes less than $18 an hour. You know, they're also ones with the 50 million without medical insurance. Their health is worse. Their schools are worse. They live in areas of more crime. They die younger. They have more of an opioid problem. That's what we've done. All that liberal shit you hear about, that's what we've done. 
And we don't sit there and say, that's what we've done. We should, and you, by, you, you never fix a problem if you don't admit it. And so we need, like I would, you know, I would tax people at the higher end more, but I'd give it directly. I'd, like I would double the income tax credit. And I wouldn't have the childcare thing. You make $14,000 a year, the government gives you 12. Th that money would go directly into the neighbors that need it and it would be used by mothers and fathers to uplift their families and it would also be spent locally. You know, and I'd get rid of some of these other programs and, you know, I, 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 the inner city schools, and I, you know, we've worked with Focus Hope, so not just the schools, it's the people who train these kids. I think Focus Hope is, you know, 12 weeks or 16 weeks where these kids can learn how to manage advanced machinery, which, by the way, would take me 16 weeks to learn, and hopefully I wouldn't lose a finger or two while I'm learning it, you know, and, you know, and, and these things work. Those jobs, you know, $55,000 a year. Data scientists, 18 years old, $65,000 a year. How many schools when they report, I think schools should, I think every government institution should tell you, I took your money, here's what we said we're gonna do, and here's what we did. You know, and I think they should add to schools, all of them, high schools, community college, all they should add, you know, things like livelihood. How many, what percent graduate making $50,000 a year or more? So you can evaluate those schools. And there's some no-brainers, like, you know, we talked yesterday about, you know, getting jobs for formerly incarcerated citizens. You know, there's some no-brainers, Pell Grants, for some of these programs so the kids can get a job. You know, it doesn't have to be a two-year or four-year program. And we can't get even the basic stuff done. And now you're seeing it again with the government shutdown. So it's quite frustrating because, you know, a lot of, like even the great stuff we've done, you've done in Detroit, all of us, it worked. But how much better would it have been had we had great federal policies? You know, a, a, a how they spent their money and what they did, what they tried to impose upon, you know, cities and states. And so we, we need a lot of work. And it's one of the reasons, like, I'm so proud of Peter, because you guys don't know this, but he does this in Detroit, he does this in D.C. Like, try to get those policies right, which can affect Detroit even more than what we do here. So, Jamie, I think I'm going to invite Jason to come out and join us, and we're going to take some questions from the audience uh, for the balance of the discussion. Jason. Absolutely. And some great questions came in. We will not get to all of them. But uh, I, I want to keep on that theme when we talk about things that can be better uh, to make the economy better. One of the things, one of the questions that came in was, the New York Times recently reported that the number of students entering college had dropped by over 2 million versus 2015. What can be done to address that concerning trend? Well, I'm not sure it's bad. I, I mean, you, you got, we, we try to analyze a lot. So we've had this obsession with college, you know, but college has gotten more and more expensive. And, 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 I, and I can't prove this, but there are studies that show that most of the kids who were college, they make more money and stuff. It's because of the socioeconomics they had before they went to college. Mm -hmm. You know, it's with mommy and daddy. And I'm not mad at them. I'm just saying that's a fact. So I, I, not, I think what we've got to be more about is skills. And what you could, whether it's community college or out of high school, or out of prison or out of skills, you know, data scientists, cyber, you know, whatever that skill is and stuff like that. So, you know, we've made... And here's another one, that we made college more expensive because the government gives out student loans without any forethought. And of course, you know, when you make something less expensive, you just get more of it. Does, does not that it's better. So it, it, that, I think that's okay that people are questioning now the value of a college degree. Excellent. And when we talk about skills, we know one of the things that we all need more of is a better plan, a better plan and path around infrastructure. How do we balance cost management with the need to address crumbling infrastructure in the United States. Okay, so I do like the Infrastructure Act that got passed. Uh, we desperately needed it. Uh, but one of the, you know, again, you gotta look at the problems. The problem is money to build new highways, bridges, bridges tunnels, roads, FAA, but you can't get some of it done. So our FAA system, if you go up to a control tower, is 50 years old. It's the old green dots. Every other country has the modern thing. But that modern thing costs money, saves lives, saves 20% of CO2 in the average flight. Can't get it done is politics. You know, as some of these things you try to get done, I don't know about Detroit in particular, but you can't get the permitting. You know, so bridges and tunnels, it could take 10 or 15 years, so think of the cost. And the other thing, we gotta change our budgeting. If it's an investment, it's like a JP Morgan Chase, if I'm, it may be called an expense, I don't care what it's called, if it's gonna have return, I do it. I could care less about the accounting part of it. And so, you know, think of hiring a, some bank opening branches here. They cost money in year one, they cost money in year two, they break even in year three, they make money in year four. I look at the life of the thing, it's very profitable, it's an investment. And so I think we had to look at it a little bit differently, but it also should be in a per perpetual upgrade. It shouldn't be like you wait every 50 years to decide, my God, we need infrastructure. 
And those of you who've been into Hong Kong or Singapore, it's kind of an embarrassment here. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna pivot a little bit and go back to banking. Obviously a lot of bankers in the room and we had a little bit of a scare earlier this year. Talk about the intersectionality between the government and obviously the need to support and stand up the banking industry a lot better. And obviously when it comes to our uh, middle market banks and some of our regional banks, they felt the biggest impact. Yeah. And so we're, you know, you first of all, we're the, one of the, the biggest bank to middle market banks, MDI banks, community banks, et cetera. We support them with loans and guarantees and products and services, cash management, FX and M&A and stuff like that. So we're supportive. And I think they have legitimate complaints. And, and uh, the, the banking crisis, it was a mini crisis. And I, if you look at the crisis, I won't bore you all, only a couple of banks were off sides in those things that badly. And so we knew First Republic was the last domino. And, and now, of course, some of these things have been used to throw tons of stuff in re rules and regulations. I, I'm not against rules and regulations. People say, you know, banks are against this. I'm for a proper regulation of any industry. You know, I don't want people dying. I don't want, now, do you want a bank never to fail? Is that the goal? Because that's the goal. We should do different things than we're doing today. Do you want banks to make mortgages cheaper? Is that the goal? Is not not the goal? And you know, some of these. So there's no forethought anymore. There's no analysis. There's no transparency around what we're doing. So I look. I object to a lot of stuff they're doing. I think it's going to make life harder for some of you and credit more expensive. But let them do what they want. I'm sick of arguing with them. And and you know, one day he loves game, going to D.C. Yeah, once uh, a quarter. But this. But the the other thing about the mini banking crisis. If you go back to what I said about inflation, stagflation, potential recession, and higher rates, that, is, that will cause a lot more stress and strain generally, including in banks. So if you're a bank in the room, you should go back to your management team and say, can we handle 70% 10-year bond rates? Can we handle stagflation? Because if the answer is no, you better readjust your balance sheet, and quickly. Because J.P. Morgan can. I would never bet my company that, well, I, rates aren't going up to 7%. Never. You know, so you, when you look at risk managers, so it's being a ha handle this whole wide range of risk, not the ones you predict, but the ones you don't predict, which are possible. And another headwind that we're facing in, in, in traditional banking, obviously, is the emergence of decentralized finance and fintech. Maybe touch on some of the great things that we're doing in the industry, not just at JP Morgan, around blockchain and emerging technologies to, to help level yeah. the playing field. Yeah, so blockchain, you know, we've been talking about it for 15 years and very little has been done. <laughs> I tell people it's kind of slow. We, we're doing a lot with blockchain. It's, it's, it's a ledger, folks. So right now you get your bank statement. You, we mail it to you. You get it online. We ship it to you. It's a ledger. We keep it. You believe it. It's, it's checked by orders and stuff like that. A blockchain is simply a ledger kept on everyone's computer at the same time through some permission system. That's all it is. It will be usable one day for contracts and movement of money and Co complex move of information. Think of trade finance, you know. It, it'll work, it's, it, it's hard to do. Uh, you know, but one of the other things that regulators get wrong, the bank, the bank industry is a vibrant thing. And they act like it's, everyone's getting bigger. No, a lot of the big ones failed. So some big ones aren't doing so well, some are doing well, some in the middle want to merge, some are doing fine on their own. And some community banks are growing and they're a fintech. They're always startups. Startup community banks, startup fintech, there's PayPal, there's Chime, there's Apple. Apple is basically a bank today. They move money, hold money, send money, ship money. That's a bank. You know, so we have to compete with that. So our job is to make sure whatever we do, that we're serving the client the way they want to be served. And so we, you know, we monitor all these things. We understand them. We build them. We add to our digital services. You can move money automatically, FX. A lot of AI goes to protecting. We move $10 trillion a day around the world. So as I'm speaking, we're moving billions of dollars. It's going through AI systems, risk systems, fraud systems. Uh, you know, to make sure we're not, you aren't sent at the wrong place, uh, and frauds and scams and stuff like that, a lot of bad guys, we're guardians of the system, and so we're always gonna be doing that. In every business, we're adding technology, and this is true for every business. What can you do to use technology to make your customer happier? So, you know, now you have restaurants who, they know what you want, they see your cars two blocks away, they ask you, do you want your regular? You know, just everything can get easier, and faster, better, cheaper, quicker, er error race drop, and we should always be thinking about that. And AI will be deployed in every single part of the company at one point. And well, we, we have 3,000 people in AI, and we have 300 use cases already. That's why I, I was gonna, I read that. I read your annual letter 
uh, and Jason and I talked about this. A lot of people are fearful of AI because they don't understand it. You have embraced it. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how the, the bank is using AI. And what I found wonderful is I think you have 300 or so ethicists yeah. who are constantly making sure that the AI is not being misused. Yeah. So we have, you know, AI, uh, not advanced data crunching. It is, it is the next new thing. It is big. It's not going to change the world tomorrow, but think of it as going to have an exponential effect. Every application, every program, every job will be affected by it and often enhanced. So you can look at your job. What would you like? It knows you're doing this. It knows when there's calls. It reads the, the web for thing, information. It's always doing things to help you. So, uh, and so we use it for things like risk, that when it's going, that's looking for patterns that are different than they ever had before. You know, people haven't used this. Like, when you, you know, if I had my phone here, it's not just whether you enter, we know your phone. It's not just whether you enter, we know how you enter your passcode. We know how you walk. Okay, so we're testing all the time what change that might mean this is a fraudulent payment. It's constantly learning and stuff like that. We lose it for prospecting. You know, we, we lose it for marketing. We use it for uh, sales, error rates, and uh, assistance. And so in private banking, I don't know if they rolled out to you guys where when you're, you know, you're talking to someone, it could take notes for you. Yeah. If a client mentions something, it'll bring up that uh, summary of that company or that product or service. You know, it's always enhancing what people do. It may eliminate some jobs over time. We are quite conscious of that. We should be thinking about that. And I think and it's going to happen whether we want it or not. I, and I think it's going to be very hard, and bad guys are going to use it. So think of voice recognition. We recognize your voice when you call us, but now the bad guys can replicate your voice. So I need voice recognition which can replicate, which can notice their replication. You know, and I'm being quite serious. So it's kind of a battle here and cyber and all that. And, and then we need to, we call it ethics and explain, because for regulators and government, they're gonna ask us, is it redlining by other means? And I also think it'd be used for reverse discrimination. For example, if you wanna make more mortgages to, to black folk, why wouldn't you use data which isn't used today for underwriting, that is a good sign of a good credit, which you can gleam off the other databases, the rent. Rent is not used in credit, which is absurd. Like, imagine you've been paying rent for 20 years, you had the same job for 20 years. You know, but you've been paid in cash. They may have no credit file, but they'd be a great credit. So there are a lot of things to do, and so the ethicist to make sure it's ethical, the explain is to make sure we can explain it, and to make sure it's not doing wrong things, because it could. Like I said, it could redline by other means. You know, um. All right, we are coming to an end, but we always end with a lightning round that's gonna be greatly reduced, because my job is to keep us on time. So two quick fun questions, and then one that we think the young leaders will love as well. So first question, this is easy. Last book you read. The what? Last book you read. Uh, the uh, last two. I just read one about Genghis Khan, which is different than you might expect, uh, and then one by Kissinger called Leadership. He writes about Lee Kuan Yew, Nixon, uh, Thatcher, uh, Sadat, uh, uh, Conrad Adenauer, who you know basically saved Germany after World War II, and De Gaulle about how they led through some of the most complex, difficult times. And then the other one I love is important, it's called The Exercise of Power by Bob Gates, and it is pertinent to what we spoke about, geopolitical stuff, that it, 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 it's called, and he has a section called The Symphony of Power. And he goes through Iran, and North Korea, and all these things, but his basic argument is we've overused the military muscle, and we've massively underused intelligence, it actually closed it down a lot of places, development finance, diplomacy, communication, trade alliances, investment alliances, you know, to, to pull the world into alliances. So those, I, I definitely recommend those last two. All right, last question, and then we're done. Advice to your 25-year-old self. Uh, drop the anger sometimes. Like, <laughs> I, I, I rarely ever yell, so it's not every year. But, but temper, which I do, I still have a little bit of one. I try to, when I come back, I try to like copacetic and like uh, from vacation, uh, but it clouds your judgment. And my advice to younger people is learn, 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 work hard, have a friggin' heart how you treat people. You know, I tell a story how I took guards back who were, you know, basically that had been outsourced because of medical, we saved money in medical. Really? You're gonna treat your people that way? You're gonna save a few bucks by doing something like that? That's, you know, I, I would put it for JP, you know, if you're, survive, if you're there to survive, they put the unethical stage, but. It, I mean, it it's okay, but you know, for JP, we shouldn't be doing something like that. Uh, learn, learn, learn. Don't become a weapon of other people. And you know, you guys are being weaponized by Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and 
and CNN and uh, the newspapers. Forget all that shit. If you're a Republican, read Tom Friedman, okay, and, and some others. Uh, if you're a Democrat, read George Will and Brett Stevens. These are very smart, ethical people who have the same heart and values you do, who, think, who basically sometimes have the same goals, but they think there's a different way to get there and that these ways didn't work and that some ways are hurting free enterprise and individualism. And just don't be a weapon. You know, don't let anger get the better of you. Don't let your friends jazz you up. Don't be a weapon. Always sit back when we talk about China. Do the full assessment. On any issue, do the full assessment and talk to people, you know, when you go to the cafeterias of a different color, a different job, a different thing, and be respectful. I do think, you know, one of the things which has hurt this country, you know, is when you go to New York and San Francisco, it, it is amazing the way people, they don't know it, you know, I know it, I live there, how much they hate, you know, old, ultra MAGA. You know, and they, they're imposing upon ultra MAGA what they think ultra MAGA means. And what they think is, and I think it's a mistake for Biden to be talking about ultra MAGA, because those are our fellow citizens. They didn't vote for Trump because they think he's a decent guy. I mean, seriously, they didn't vote for Trump because of anything. They voted for Trump because they can't stand the goddamn elite. And I kind of agree on that point. You know, you, you better be very careful about why people are making these arguments and jazzing people up. I'm not, don't, I don't support Trump, so don't get me wrong on that one. But, <laughs> but um, uh, so just have your own eyes and ears and learn and listen. You know, if you just travel, you're here in Detroit, but travel into the hinterland. And, and another thing that's beautiful, I took my bus trip this year, we spoke. Spokane, Boise, Bozeman, uh, uh, Jackson Hall. We did a black event at Martha's Vineyard. You know, uh, it's, it's vibrant. People like each other. Entrepreneurism, they're, they're pro-American. They're not, they don't, a lot of them don't pay that much attention to CNN and uh, MSNBC and Fox. All right, well with that, God bless America. God bless you, Jamie. Thank you for being <laughs> Congratulations here. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Dennis, great job. Steve. Wow, that was amazing. And on behalf of our DEC board and DEC members, Jamie and Peter and team, we want to say thank you for being on our team. Your incredible $200 million investment in the city of Detroit has had massive impact. How about another round of applause for Jamie? Thank you. Thank you. Dennis and Jason, thanks for your time and talents and Thank playing you. very important roles. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite you to please join us for a strolling lunch with other DEC members in the ballroom. If you did purchase 10 tickets, you'll have your company name and logo on a reserved table. Uh, if not, then it's just uh, uh, free for all, mix and mingle with um, some fun people. So tell your friends and colleagues to join the DEC. You won't find a better group of people. I love saying it. On time, every time. This meeting of the Detroit Economic Club is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>